Hey Zook family, welcome back. It's another week and another chance to speak to a local hero. And Eddie <laughs> is exactly that. He's the local naturist here in Resorts World Genting, currently 3,000 feet above sea level, 2,500 feet above Kuala Lumpur. Today we'll call it Taman Zook Nagara. And Eddie That's is going right to introduce name. us to the most incredible wildlife, flowers, and basically the most beautiful relaxing setting so close to Kuala Lumpur, the hub, the hustle, the bustle. If you're stressed, you want to get away for the weekend, this is the man who's going to relax you. Eddie, how are you? <laughs> Fine, thank you very much. Welcome to Taman Zook Nagara. Yeah, thank you so much for <laughs> renaming it just for us. So Eddie, tell me, where are we? Oh, we're in the best part in Malaysia. Best part in Malaysia, best forest in Malaysia. Uh, we are in the state of Pahang. Uh, we are actually located quite close to Kuala Lumpur, which is just barely an hour. From Kuala Lumpur and uh, we reach heights of uh, 6,000 feet above sea level. And, and what can you find here? Oh exciting stuff yeah we have every wildlife except for the big boys uh, being the elephants and all that uh, but uh, we have everything else from uh, uh, primate species we have five primate species uh, apart from those we also have wild goats and uh, we have um, uh, all, uh, 253 species of birds uh, we have 1,500 species of uh, uh, moths uh, and, and also some butterflies and uh, of course um, beautiful plants. And yeah. what we're going to do today is we're going to go and see some of this wildlife, some of these yes. plants. We're yes. going to be, if we're lucky, we'll catch some gibbons, which is exceptionally rare in Malaysia, especially around Kuala Lumpur. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Uh, this is the only place I must say uh, personally that uh, you know you can find gibbons everywhere. Fingers crossed we can find some today. Also, you have flowers here that you can't find anywhere else in Malaysia. Oh, that's true too. Um, we have uh, endemic uh, species, that's what we call them. Endemic species means they're only found on this particular mountain. Uh, we have uh, carnivorous plants, such as uh, three species of, of, of carnivorous plants, which is their name as uh, Nepenthes sanguinea, Nepenthes lamispina, and Nepenthes uh, mcfalani. Apart from that, we have the, uh, a species of conifer, our own Christmas tree. That's only found only on Genting Highlands. And if people were to come and visit Genting Highlands, you don't just have to take our word from it, you don't just need to watch this video, but you can do the most beautiful hikes around this mountain. Oh yes, yeah, super. Um, this is a mountain that is the uh, least hiked in Malaysia. Uh, soon we hope to be opening it to the, to the public and uh, to people to enjoy climbing from uh, the lowland areas right up to the top. We, we, we're currently being welcomed by yeah. Chikadia here. In yeah, Genting. yeah, you get uh, Chikada, yeah. It's community. Yeah, uh, we have the largest cicada here as well. Uh, you, you, uh, you have the Empress cicada and you actually have the, uh, the Emperor cicada. Well, Eddie, yeah. you've been here for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, will be surprised. You have such an extensive knowledge of this local community of wildlife flowers. But you used to be a tennis coach. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, I have many careers actually. So that's about around uh, give and take 20, 20, yeah, more than 20 years ago. I was a tennis coach before I came to Genting Highlands actually. And you had yeah. a Paralympian. Yes, we had a Paralympian. I was lucky to be able to coach a, 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 a kind of ambitious uh, uh, Paralympic uh, athlete. Uh, we managed to reach uh, Athens Olympic in 2004. Uh, he's the first Paralympian in wheelchair tennis uh, in uh, for Malaysia. Wow, that's an incredible career. So, enough of me talking. Why don't you take a suit? Let's go. Okay, sure. All right, let's go. So, Eddie, as we go into the Awana Bio Park all the way up here, 3,000 feet above sea level, deep in the jungle of Genting Highlands. Mm -hmm. What can we find? What are we going to see? Oh, the very exciting thing. Let me, let me, let's go for a walk and I'll show you. Sure. Yeah. So Eddie, what, what do we find down here? Um, the key feature of our forest here, this height at Awana is the mountain timber. That's why uh, this forest is given its name, Upper Diptero Cup Forest. So um, we have a variety of, um, timber species um, that are actually very useful and uh, very commercial uh, what do you call it value of com of commercial value and so once we get right down to the bottom of this slope and I'll, I'll show you some of the trees that's already uh, that's still there sure. so if we stop for a second Eddie I can hear so many noises around us what kind of wildlife are we listening to right now ah okay you just heard a tree hole frog uh, you heard some uh, smaller species of birds that's uh, around. Uh, those are the flower packers. Um, no, that's a that, that's a small bird. You can see right over there. Very, oh, there it goes. There it goes. More more small bird species. Uh, what else can I hear? Cicadas, little crickets, and the wind. 
Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah, right there. You can hear the crested serpent eagle. Right there, he's perched on the branch. It's very rare to see an eagle in Malaysia. Uh, not really. We are, uh, actually, they're common birds. Uh, we have a variety of species. Depending on the species, you might find some rare ones. Yeah, crested serpent eagles are common for uh, Genting Highlands. Oh, yeah. phenomenal. Are there any birds that are only found in Genting Highlands? Uh, there may be one or two species that are found basically here in Genting Highlands, but generally most of them are common birds that are also found elsewhere in Malaysia. Eddie, you've managed to give us a real treat by spotting some gibbons, and I never expected to see <laughs> them cross the road in a family. You have a variety, I mean, you've got 12 families of gibbons here, and they all have their own personality, they all have their own history and heritage in Genting Highlands. Can you tell us about some of them? Yes, uh, more specifically, I'd like to tell you about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, um, They were the first couple that we spotted uh, way back in uh, 2015. Uh, uh, at that time, we were driving past a, a road, and uh, what happened was uh, we stopped by when we heard uh, two calls. Uh, Romeo was one side of the road and Juliet was on the other side of the road. Uh, so we got down and uh, started to enjoy and recording their calls. Uh, unfortunately, on that particular day, uh, we left. We had to leave the place, but we could not see them come together. Uh, but, well, short of the story is that three months later, yeah, we found our, uh, um, both pairs, or rather the pair were together. Uh, what happened was that uh, uh, we discovered that Romeo owns one side of the forest which is on his side of the road, and then Julia owns the other side of the road. Uh, what happened was they got together. Yeah? And, and so in order to get together, they had to do the, well, take risks. Uh, and so Romeo did the job by crossing the road and got to, 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 to Juliet. And since then, we've been seeing them crossing the road very regularly. And then we start to find out uh, or, or research uh, what caused them to actually cross the road and take risks. And what we found out was a very special um, fact that uh, Juliet owns this part of the forest and then uh, Romeo owns the other part of the forest, uh, which means that they are territorial uh, uh, gibbons. Now, if they do not look after one side of the forest, they might lose it to other gibbons. And that's why you see them crossing road, taking, taking risks. Uh, we named them Romeo and Juliet because for that three months while they were uh, sort of uh, calling to each other, uh, it was... Uh, sounding very very uh, what do you call it uh, kind of romantic yeah they were trying to get to each other they found each other but they just couldn't get to each other because of the road in between and and you also have uh, some transformer inspired oh yeah so uh, we as you mentioned earlier we have basically 12 uh, families of gibbons on the south face of Genting Highlands uh, we managed to photograph them uh, what happens is we gave them everyone a name so they actually have characters uh, as we uh, further discovered uh, I'll give you the rest, the names of the other, the other gibbons. Uh, we have Ramses, yeah. Uh, Ramses is a family of four. Uh, why we gave it Ramses? It was kind of spur of the moment that we were inspired seeing uh, them in, uh, in, in, in their behavior. Uh, we have others as well, uh, you know, the movie Transformers and all that. Yeah, so uh, we, we are inspired by uh, Optimus and Megatron. Of course, we discovered Optimus first and decided to name him Optimus uh, in view of his uh, basically physique, it looks like uh, yeah, Optimus Prime. Uh, then we discovered uh, Megatron. Uh, why Megatron? Because Megatron was slightly larger in size than, uh, than, than Optimus and they were in, on the opposing side of the ridge. And that's why we, we came up with these two names for them. Uh, we have another one that's named after a moss in, in, at Awana, uh, which is Noah. Uh, and then we have other um, families uh, uh, at the hydroponic farm, which we uh, named them a salad. And we have the other one which is called Leonidas, and simply because he's bigger than Megatron. Yeah. Uh, then we have the other a pair called David and Bathsheba. Uh, that's also uh, that's follow uh, through from the couple we met, uh, it's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, of course, the oldest family uh, and the oldest looking uh, male of all the families is Chewbacca. And that's found uh, adjacent to Gotong Villa. And Socrates as well. Yeah, I miss Socrates. Now, uh, Socrates is my favorite actually in terms of the fact that uh, they are a performing arts family. Yeah, they, they're able to uh, perform acrobatic stunts uh, to, to, to us, to the public that are able to uh, cite them. So, so Eddie, it's not just gibbons you get here, you get a variety yes. of monkeys. I see them yes. on the golf course all the time. Yep. But what I never understood is that the monkey community and families 
is very much controlled by the alpha males. And yes. what I will often see when I look across the golf course is you'll have some alphas on the outside who will pave the way for the mothers carrying yes. the children. Yes. We just saw a very interesting scenario where to the layman, we just saw a very muscular monkey who I would <laughs> presume is an alpha, but you yeah, he, tell me that he's yes. been expelled from his family. Yes, uh, somewhere during the MCO, uh, we, we came across uh, him uh, with his family. Uh, and then uh, there was um, uh, an, an incident where we saw him with another alpha male uh, on a particular tree. And there was a little, uh, what do you call that? Um, scuffle. Uh, yes, little scuffle going on on, on the tree. Uh, that was on day one. Uh, on day two, uh, we saw them again together on the same tree. And this time around, we managed to drive our car right down to the roadside. And they both came over to us. Uh, then we were able to uh, see on day two that uh, who was um, well, the head honcho of that particular family. Uh, three, four days later, we found the position was reversed. That the young uh, alpha male has taken over the family or the tribe. And this other, uh, the older alpha male uh, was by himself instead of being with his family. So he'd been shunned from the family and the young alpha male had taken control. Yes, that's correct. Yes. yes Fascinating. Yeah. And, and there's a message that you shared with us before, which is really important. It's very common that you see people giving bread, giving rice, mm. giving mm. Um, scraps to monkeys. And it's not a positive move for their community because these are, obviously they have instincts in order to survive in the wild and we're not yes. helping them by doing this. Yes, um, it's true. So yeah, universally and uh, as a global view, uh, no feeding will be the best policy. Uh, but unfortunately, because they uh, come in close contact with the residential areas and with, with, with proximity to uh, towns and all that, uh, they are able to, you know, get in contact with uh, food uh, that are left over at, at trash cans and all that. But there is also people willing to feed them. And what we discovered is that people feed them because uh, it goes with a little bit of a local culture that we love to see wildlife, you know, uh, being, you know, um, fed with something. Uh, what is happening at this location that we have earlier, uh, they are a menace uh, to the residents in that particular area and therefore uh, some feeding was carried out in order to draw them away uh, from them being a nuisance in the residential area. Uh, we found that that particular uh, strategy worked, Yeah, uh, we got them out of the condo. Um, but then we saw, although we saw 80% of the problem, we, we were still looking forward to solve the issue of feeding them. And what we discovered during this part of the, uh, the, the stage of uh, research is that uh, after being fed with a little bit of food, we saw them spending the rest of the day back in the forest and feeding on other, uh, what do you call that, uh, uh, food from plants. So we feel that uh, there is a balance. And so now we are still monitoring and to see if uh, they can be, they will be habituated uh, under these circumstances at this particular location. So um, we still have to look at the situation because it's not necessary that, you know, uh, they, um, uh, that is a bad policy if you actually feed them in the long term. But I think in the overall message is to not feed them with your scraps um, because they can survive in the wild, yes, they can yes. eat from foliage yes. and it actually encourages them to become, as you say, a pest um, yes. beg, and even sometimes steal the food. Yes, that's right. I agree with you on that. Better, yeah. So uh, this is one of the special uh, uh, timber trees that's uh, found in our forest. Uh, actually, it's not non-native of, uh, of, of, of Malaysia, it's basically uh, native of Sumatra and Sumatra is just basically about 150 kilometers uh, from our location. Um, finding it here is actually very special uh, and, and that's why we cleared this area in order to, to be able to see the, uh, the whole spec of this uh, particular uh, timber tree. The name, uh, well, we gave it a nickname, it's called Optimus, uh, but it's a common name, it's Rasamala. This is an Indonesian uh, name given to it by the natives of uh, Sumatra. Uh, so the scientific name is Altinja excelsa. This particular tree is called a kodondong tree. This is wild kodondong. Kodondong is a fruit that you can actually uh, buy in the marketplace, but this is the wild uh, 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 species. Uh, the fruits are basically uh, the favorite of uh, deers as well as wild goats. All right, this particular tree is called bakak and uh, it produces fruits the size of oranges and or orangey in color. Uh, they're basically uh, the favorite of hornbills. 
uh, we have basically five species of hornbills and all species of hornbills will end up on this tree when it's pruning. This particular tree, we didn't have a signboard on here. Uh, it's called Agalaya, A-G-L-A-I-A. Uh, Agalaya uh, is a sappy, uh, sap producing uh, timber. So when woodpecker or certain types of beetles, uh, you know, bite into the bark, what happens is uh, they produce uh, or the sap oozes out of the, of, the, of, of the bark. Now, when this particular sap uh, dries up, um, they become frankincense. These are fresh frankincense which I just picked up from the ground. And there you go. In a short while you see the smoke come out of it. There you go. And then they're basically Yeah, yeah, yeah. This for uh, prayer joysticks, and then uh, on temples, they were, they were, this, uh, these are fresh ones. Can I use this for date night? Uh, yeah, you can, you can, you can. You, you got to, I uh, know, you got to light up there. <laughs> <laughs> How old is our forest? 130 million years old. Uh, what's the oldest uh, feature of our forest? Is this basically this particular, this particular tree? Yeah. Uh, estimate 350 years old. So. We all know Elvis is the king of rock and roll, but you have your own <laughs> Elvis here who's the king of this jungle. I mean, the size yes. is unbelievable. Yes. It's got to be as tall as the tower of a Awana Hotel. Yes, 20 story is the height of Awana Hotel. Uh, yes, uh, we gave it uh, its name Elvis simply because uh, when you look at it from, that, uh, from the broad side, you actually see that it has a hip. And it reminds us of Elvis, uh, you know, uh, jiving his hips uh, <laughs> when he goes rock and roll. Um, another reason why we, we name him Elvis is because um, uh, these are strangler fig trees species, and basically they have forms. And his this particular species or this particular tree specimen here, uh, it has a very masculine form, and co coinciding with the hip, so we name him Elvis. Uh, I'm going to show you another one uh, which has got a lot of curves, and so the, she's pretty graceful. Yeah, and so we named her Gracie. Yeah, so uh, we're going to take you to see Grace shortly. Yeah. This this is not just one of the most beautiful mountains you'll ever discover, but thanks to Eddie's descriptions, we've got so much character here from Optimus Prime and his Transformer <laughs> set of gibbons through to Elvis and the performing trees. There is literally never a moment to get bored here. You... Uh, no, no, I uh, we have never got bored at any stage of our walk. So Eddie, we met Elvis. Now we met his girlfriend, Gracie, the <laughs> capacious Gracie. So tell us a bit about Gracie. Yeah, um, um, the the difference between Gracie and Elvis is that she she has got curves. So you can see the curves on the on on the uh, buster's roots on this side. And so we, we, we relate that to femininity. So uh, that's why we named her Grace. You were just explaining to me that Grace has been complaining to you. Uh, yeah, uh, some, some time back we had a, a French couple who came over to walk our forest. And they actually love uh, whispering to trees. They, they call themselves tree whispers. Uh, and we took them here and uh, they uh, told us that uh, Gracie, uh, they, they, this is what they did. Uh, they just went to touch the tree like that uh, and then bend down a little bit then they got a message from Gracie and the message was she lacks attention <laughs> and then that was the true story too because why we've always avoided coming here uh, and always uh, took a shortcut back so um, uh, she must have really communicated the right thing <laughs> to this couple the zoo family has to come and pay some attention to Gracie. Easily yeah. the tallest woman I think I've ever met. Oh, yeah. Isn't she wonderful? So Eddie's taken us around the rainforest and he's literally, as I call him, the landlord <laughs> of this rainforest. And he has one of his tenants right here, live. The, the common leech. So you're very comfortable with this man in your hand. I'd be running away from him, but tell us about <laughs> these. Well, okay, uh, they're the tiger leech uh, species. Uh, that's the only species we have here on this uh, mountain. You can see this guy is an adult because he can get to about an inch in, uh, uh, in length. Uh, the joke has it that, you know, he can actually do palm reading. Well, okay. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. But they're genuinely quite harmless. 
They are basically quite harmless. Uh, the only thing is that because they, they prefer to suck your blood, and that's why it become a menace. But otherwise, they, they are quite harmless, yeah. You see, he's moving from my palm uh, right up to the surface here on top of my hand. The reason is because this, my skin here is thinner than the skin on the palm. So he's now finding a location where he can sort of, there you go, he's just about to give me a good bite. And you can see my veins over here, that's where the blood vessels are. Uh, he's just finding a spot. So you mostly find them in moist hikes because downtown I've done some hikes that are dry hikes. Yes. Where the temperature is 30 degrees, mm -hmm. very dry, often concrete based and you don't find them. So you tend to find them in more of the moist atmosphere. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. They're found uh, in, in more moist rainforests, uh, areas where there's a lot of rainfall. Uh, two, they also, uh, 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 what do you call it, in abundance uh, in areas where there are a lot of wildlife, uh, especially wild boars. All right. Yeah, you can hold it. Okay, he's going to read your palm. And then, uh, since this is a Wi-Fi rainforest, we have, uh, he will WhatsApp. This fella's telling me basically you. that 2021 <laughs> is going to be an amazing year for the zoo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I agree with that one, yeah. There you go. See, you got only of your fear. Let me, let me scratch the blood. <laughs> Manipulating the poor leech Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there you go. So which is the head? This is uh, no, no. That, that's a sucker. That's the tail. Mm -hmm. All right. That, that's the base part. Mm -hmm. And this is the sucker part. Oh. That's where the teeth are going to be. So the teeth is the one that's going to He's got a sensor there. Okay. So Eddie, yeah. let me mm. ask you the question. People are often petrified of leeches. Mm. Somewhat unnecessarily. But let's say one jumps on you and you're really uncomfortable. Most people will, will, will freeze. What is mm. your advice on how to deal with this? Well, uh, well, the moment you see a leech on your, your, uh, any part of your body, um, the easiest thing to do is just use your fingers to pick him up from somewhere. And, uh, okay, go ahead, yeah, yeah, pick him up uh, and then put it in your palm of your hand. Yeah, uh, and, and then, oh, of course, to, to sort of, uh, you want to get rid of it? Uh, well, that's the technique we use. Uh, just go over it, yeah, make round balls out of it, yeah. So leeches don't yeah. like heat? They don't like heat, yes. In this case, let's see. And so they loosen up, they don't grip you anymore, neither with the suckers or from the mouth. But they're very robust, so hitting them will not do anything. No, yeah, they're so rubbery that they even you have, you have, go ahead and uh, give it a hard tap and see. That will wake them up actually, yeah. see, there you go. Uh, yeah, we, we have demonstrated this every time we bring people here because they, they freak out with the, with the leech, but this is That's great this advice, is technique, I actually yeah. really like that and, part. And of course, when you want to pull it off, you can pull it off actually at any time. Of course, there's a local belief uh, that, you know, when it's already uh, there for several minutes already and it's fattened up, so you will let it, uh, you know, uh, uh, let it continue until, until it let loose. Oh, okay. But you can actually pull it off if you need, you need to. Okay. The only thing is that how you will treat your wound after. Mm. Okay, so you need to treat it almost immediately because the moment you pull it off, uh, it's already had a puncture, so what happens is your, your, it secretes herodine and what happens is the blood thinner and therefore your, your yeah, blood will continue bleeding, bleeding. Bleeding. Yeah, will be bleeding. So you need to uh, uh, have a little technique on how you would put a plaster onto your, yeah, uh, onto the wound.